Hello, it's Blue Orange 22 So this is a message to the Men's Lib subreddit and to male feminists in general. The reason why this video is so long, um, I would like to invite you, we would like to invite you to the uh, Men Are Human Discord, which is the semi-official uh, Discord of the Men's Rights subreddit. And I promise this intro will not be uh, very long. But we do a talk every Friday. And this past Friday, you were actually the topic of conversation. There was an AMA recently on the Men's Lib subreddit um, regarding the um, Duluth model and domestic violence against men. And a lot of you guys seemed very confused and upset over what you saw. A lot of you were saying, you know, it seems like this feminist model of domestic violence is completely discriminatory against men and completely unfair. And a lot of you were very surprised at it. And so there was an open letter um, circulating on a lot of men's rights subs basically saying to men's libbers that we've been kind of warning you about this. And we're not saying all feminists are bad. We're not saying that all feminists feel that way. What we're saying is there are some feminist groups that happen to be quite influential that when you take a close look at what they actually do, um, it's not really equality at all. And that's what we're trying to tell you. So I reached out to some men's libbers and I'm reaching out to you now. I'm about to show you the talk um, and we invite you to please come into the Discord and uh, kind of see what we're about. So I'll put a link to all of that below, and uh, here we go. Hello, and welcome to the weekly voice chat for Men Are Human. Uh, we are the semi-official Discord of the Men's Rights subreddit. Today's topic, if you want to go to the voice discussion section, uh, I just posted a Reddit post. And this was an open letter to the Men's Lib subreddit. Uh, following an AMA they had with a member from the Duluth Model organization. And a lot of men's libbers were very upset and very surprised that the Duluth Model guy was very much hesitant to recognize male victims of domestic violence and was very hesitant to recognize the fact that domestic violence can go both ways. And our open letter to them basically said, listen, we understand you guys mean well. We know a lot of male feminists are coming from a good place, and a lot of female feminists too. But you have to understand that there are some very toxic portions of the feminist movement today. And a lot of the feminist theory and a lot of the feminist organizations don't actually practice what they preach. And the Duluth model is an example of that. So we invited a member of, um, actually a moderator from the Men's Lib and Against Hate subreddits uh, subreddit, um, his name is Worsen Hipster, and again, he is working, so I'm not sure he can be here now, but he's certainly going to listen after the fact, and a lot of men's libbers are going to be listening to this after the fact, so everyone please be polite. But that's kind of what we're talking about today. We're talking about men's lib, the subreddit, and how a lot of men feel frustrated by feminism, and a lot of male feminists feel frustrated. By all the time I see posts saying things like, in the men's lib subreddit, saying things like, oh... I feel ashamed to be male. I feel guilty for being male, which is such an unhealthy mindset. So that is the topic, and uh, let's get it going. Uh, Ma, do you have anything to say or anything to add? Well, to be honest, I think you uh, really unsold how apocalyptic that AMA was for the uh, male abuse victims in the sub. If you read through it, the story you get is basically um, somebody asks a question and this Chuck guy swoops in, uh, bombs the hell out of it with um, basically saying that uh, male abuse victims are actually lying and they are telling people, you know, like they're, uh, you know, they're trying to get away with abusing women. So. If uh, a man says he's being abused by a woman, it's actual evidence that he's abusing the woman. So it's uh, it's a Kafkaesque system, like quite literally. Uh, at least uh, Chuck Derry, what Chuck Derry is saying is um, that if a guy, you know, speaks up in, you know, if he doesn't speak up, he's an abuser. If he does speak up, he's even more of an, of an abuser and he's admitted it and he's trying to manipulate the system. And then uh, abuse victims would come in and they would say that they were horrified by this. 
they would say that they didn't know what was going on. They would, like, a bunch of them broke down in the chat and were just almost like you could hear them crying behind the screen almost. And and that's then sorry Chuck to Chuck would totally ignore them. Yeah, and, and sorry to cut you off, but that's kind of the message that we've been trying to get out to Men's Lib for a long time. We promise you, we are not the bad guys. And the idea that we're just secretly misogynistic is just not true. I mean, we do genuinely care about men's issues. And we do genuinely care about men's rights. And the reason why we're anti-feminist, we're not against the idea of feminism. And we say this almost every week in these chats, it seems. But what we are against, we're not against the principle of feminism as a concept. But we are against some specific actions from some specific feminist groups. And the Duluth model is a very influential feminist group. And they're doing damage. They're doing harm. And so, yeah, we're going to call it out. The thing that really gets me is that even in that thread and in the thread, like the uh, aftermath thread that they had on there, uh, the mods were deleting comments from anyone saying that uh, the Duluth model comes from feminism directly. And it's built out of patriarchy theory and all that other stuff. And they were refusing to acknowledge the link there. And they're refusing to acknowledge the fact that there has to be some sort of criticism of this before anyone can move forward. Because uh, it, it's just like, I, I really feel sorry for them having to live in this environment where they just can't speak out about the real problem. To me, I've always said it's, it's managed opposition. Like, they're not allowed to speak out, but they're given a space where they're told they can. Right. Right. I, I, I just want to say, uh, uh, sorry, Willie, I just want to say, uh, again, um, um, Worse Than Hipster has joined our uh, uh, server. He can't be here right now because uh, he's working, but he will be listening to this. He is a moderator of both Men's Lib and Against, against Hate Subs. And both of those are considered pretty anti-MRA. But we had a very, very positive conversation last night where he came in and we did some debating, but we found a lot of common ground. And I respect him. I really enjoy talking to him. He seems like a very decent person, a very intelligent person. He seems a very genuine person. And so I think we, we, we made a lot of progress in kind of bridging our two communities. And that's something that I've wanted to do, we've wanted to do for a very long time. And I feel that went very, very well. So um, when you do listen to this, Worse and Hipster, again, thank you so much for coming. You're always welcome here. We had a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, so, you know, again, I, what I would tell you and the rest of your mods and both of your subreddits is, yes, there are toxic elements to the men's rights movement. But here, what we stand for is just equality for all, decent behavior, respectful behavior, being civil. That's kind of what we're all about. Um, and so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding as to what MRAs actually believe and you know, who we actually are. But um, kind of sucks that you have work right now. I understand work is work. I mean, I'm only doing this now because I'm on lunch break. So I'm going to have to leave early. It's kind of how the real world works. But yeah, so um, I think we've definitely made some uh, good progress. Um, but to what Ma said, I do uh, feel sorry for a lot of male feminists who are very much trapped in this very confusing mentality where they're told seemingly paradoxical things or mutually exclusive things. So I can only imagine how challenging that must be. Hey, guys, um, could I give a little bit of input here? Please. Sure. Okay. Um, first, I'd just like to say that, you know, before this, um, I was pretty active on r slash men's lib and in the men's lib community. I'm, I was very supportive of them and I, I still am supportive of them. Um, I might not agree with them on all of their theories, but I'm just supportive of them as people and and end of their goals. Right. So please, if you're a men's lib person listening to this, I have no enmity with you or anything like that. So please just give me um, a piece of your mind. Now, if we look at the things that Chuck Derry were saying, 
I disagree with him. I'm really happy that he's willing to help, you know, female victims of domestic violence. I disagree with what he said about male victims of domestic violence. But if if we are to probably look at um, the the Z theory, for example, that patriarchy is the main cause of domestic violence against women, and that domestic violence against men is, you know, less priv- less prevalent and and that, you know, male victims or rather men, um, they're the advantaged ones and everything like that. I'm just going to very quickly read you something that was written by this lady called Katie Trastrom Fenton, who was talking about um, uh, making domestic violence shelters for male victims, right? So she said um, in her article, Unpopular Opinion, Men's domestic violence shelters are a misuse of nonprofit funding, right? So then she talks about how, you know, it's good that male victims of domestic violence are coming forward. But at the end of the day, it's still better to help women because, you know, if you help men, you're not helping women at the same time and that kind of thing, right? And then she begins to kind of, um, how do I say, kind of, disagree with MRAs. For example, she says here, um, domestic violence is one enactment of patriarchy where someone, most often a woman, is robbed of her personhood and treated like possession of her most often male abuser. We live in a culture where boys are advertised to by telling them a product will get them, will get girls where objectification of women in advertising is still rampant. Right. So she talks about how patriarchy is is one of the main things that causes domestic violence. Right. And um, yeah, so here she says, I am personally wary of domestic violence shelters for men because one of men's rights activists rallying cries is why aren't there domestic violence shelters for men? They ask this without ever acknowledging that the whole reason that interpersonal violence is even seen as problematic in the first place is because of feminism, right? So let me just quickly post the the archive of this because this was on ExoJane and ExoJane is no longer, um, it's, it, it, it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know what happened to it. I think it got shut down. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, I've posted it on voice discussion, right? So if we look at what she says here, that it's only seen as problematic in the first place is because of feminism. Domestic violence, at least in the US and the UK, has been seen as problematic since as far back as the 1600s, right? So men who beat their wives, they could be beaten, um, they could be beaten up by people in, in the communities around them. They could be publicly whipped. They could be strapped to a donkey and have ride the donkey backwards. It's called uh, riding skimming turns, right? So it's it's been a thing for for a really long time to punish um, male perpetrators of domestic violence, right? Since a very very long time, it's that's been the case. It's not something that only happened because of the feminist movement, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, In a study done by, one second, let me get this person's name, um, Elizabeth Katz. She gives one example here, right? And this is in the very early 1900s. She says, okay, um, she was talking about a specific case of, of, of when a wife came forward to complain about her husband beating her. And this is what happened. A fine or imprisonment will do such a, a, a brute as you no good, exclaimed Elder Man B.A. Uh, McKelvey. Sorry, I, I, can't, I, I don't really know that much about American names. To defendant Luis Sambolia, after hearing evidence against him in Hazleton, Pennsylvania court in 1907. I am going to give you the punishment you deserve. The, infuriate, the infuriated judge seized Sambolia by the collar, dragged him outside the courthouse, stripped the clothing from his back, and handcuffed him to a post. Using a belt quickly provided by a bystander, the young and strong McKelvey vigorously flogged Sambolia until he fell to his knees and cried for mercy. Sambolia's victim stood with evident satisfaction as the crowd applauded 
the judge's speedy approach to justice. The crime that prompted the judge to take justice into his own hands, wife beating, right? So this whole paper talks about how violence was violence against women or violence against wives was also seen as problematic prior to the 1970s, right? So it's um, <laughs> no, uh, no perspective. It's not Elizabeth Katz. It's Katz with a Z and a K. So it's, it's always been seen in many communities as improper to beat women. That's, that's, that's just a fact, right? And now if we look at, you know, the present day, um, the, the, the present day situation of domestic violence, um, Murray Strauss, he has a paper here that talks about domestic violence. And he found that by the 2000s, there were over 140 studies shown similar rates of domestic violence between men and women, right? And then he says this in the report. A central feature of the feminist theory is that PV occurs because men use violence to maintain dominance in their marital relationship. This is certain... This is certainly true. What it ignores is that it is not only it is only one of many risk factors for PV and that women as well as men use violence to dominate. Figure two presents the results of a study of 854 students at two American universities. It shows that dominance by either partner is associated with an increased probability of PV. So actually what he's pretty much saying here is that there is some truth to the fact that some men might use physical violence to dominate in a relationship, but that's actually one of the many, many reasons that PV actually occurs. And women are just as likely to use violence to control within a relationship. So, you know, when, whenever you have a study, whenever you want to test for something, you know, this is, this is just, you know, common things that you learn in university in your research methods class, right? You have to have a control group and you have to have an experimental group. If the results of the control group and the experimental group are the same, then you cannot say that the treatment is, is what's bringing up the new results, right? So if men and women both use uh, violence within a relationship to control one another at similar rates, then you cannot argue the domestic uh, violence is a is a result of men being encouraged to perpetrate violence against women and control women right that's that's just something that not happens that that doesn't happen right in another um study right in another study um they were again trying to test for the male control um in 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 a relationship theory Right, And they had this to say, the aim of the current study was to test several predictions derived from contrasting approaches to understanding IPV. The male control theory of IPV, derived separately from feminist and evolutionary theory, predicts that there would be sex differences in IPV and the use of control tactics within the relationship. According to feminist researchers, and then they give the amount, of feminist research is there. IPV is mostly perpetrated by men who use their aggression to maintain power and control within the family structure. Male power is rooted in patriarchal societal structure, which tolerates the use of violence against women as a tool for control. This view of IPV holds that it has a specific ep epiteology and should be studied separately from aggression in other contexts. An influential evolutionary view of IPV has similar predictions but differs in ultimate source of male control. In this case, the male proprietary mindset is deemed to have arisen from the maladaptive consequences of raising another man's offspring. So they just did a quick overview of what, you know, are common views of, of, ma of, of, of domestic violence. You know, that's caused by patriarchy, that is caused by, you know, men being naturally more aggressive, right? Uh, and then this is where they discuss the results of the study. They say, the findings from the present study did not support the male control view of IPV in the following ways. First, we found in as many previous studies using unselected samples, then men were not more physically aggressive to their partners than women were. Indeed, we found the opposite, that women reported being more physically and verbally aggressive to their partners than men were. 
We also found, again consistent with many previous studies, that in the same sample, men reported more physical aggression to same-sex non-intimates than women did. Thus, we added to a small number of studies that have demonstrated these contrasting patterns within the same sample, right? Again, I will post that study. So what this essentially says is that, you know, patriarchy is not the big bad in domestic violence. It's not only men committing violence against women. It's women also sometimes committing violence against men if you want to look at the full picture of domestic violence. So it is it's not okay to say that um, p- patriarchy is the, is the biggest or the main reason for domestic violence, right? And then here we have, uh, I promise this is the last one, a book written by Richard B. Felson, and I've talked about him before. He's a researcher that does a lot of research into violence and gender specifically. And if you look through a lot of his um, research, you'll find that he many different studies have found that people actually have more compassion for female victims of domestic violence than they do have for male ones, that they view hitting women as worse than hitting men, that they view, um, you know, uh, women hitting men as not as bad as men hitting women or men hitting other men, right? So they, and then he even had a study called the normative protection of women, right? And he actually disagrees with the theory that the reason why women are more protected than men is because of women's fertility, because even elderly women are protected much more than men, right? So in his, he wrote a whole book about this. It's called Violence and Gender Reexamine. And from the overview, it says, using a comparative method to determine how violence against women differs from violence against men, Felsen illustrates not only that violence against women is less frequent than violence against men, but also that our culture and legal system treated more harshly. Contrary to the claims that our courts blame the victim in cases of violence against women, the author shows that the tradition of protection of women sometimes produces the opposite effect and that it is due process and not sexism that makes, for instance, rape cases seem biased against women. This powerful book um, encourages all readers, be they psychologists, lawyers, social scientists, or concerned lay people, to question preconceptions about gender and violence. Okay, so the, the main focus of what we're discussing here is not rape, but, you know, violence against women, right? So you can see in, in the book that, if anything, sexism actually decreases violence against women because, you know, how many men do you know say that they would never hit a woman? You know, so many men. I know so many men like that, right? But finally... um. You know, the common, the common um, patriarchal, uh, another part of patriarchal theory is that the reason why male victims of domestic violence are deemed as unimportant is because apparently they say that, you know, under patriarchy, women are viewed as inferior and, you know, intellectually disabled or whatever. And that means that they can't possibly be capable of violence. Now, I disagree with this. Right. And I'm going to give you a reason. You know, if you look at Umberto Eco's um, list for identifying a fascist, you'll see that one of the things he or she states is that the the enemy will seem both uh, physically, uh, not physically, sorry, both stronger and weaker than the opposition, right? So it wouldn't make much sense if, let's say, for example, we did live in a patriarchal, misogynist, evil world, you know, Women would be viewed as evil and violent, even if we weren't, you know, and it was it was men who would be viewed as, you know, the sweet and 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 harmless ones, you know. But the fact that it's actually the opposite, that women are viewed as the sweet and harmless ones and that men are viewed as the violent ones. It actually it's actually again, it actually goes against this patriarchal misogynistic theory. Right. And the fact that we have much more resources for female victims of domestic violence than male victims of domestic violence and that female domestic violence victims and and these all of these um, organizations that deal with them are supported by the government, are supported by things like the UN. It actually shows that, you know, women and, you know, female victims have a lot of um, influence. Right. Now, I wouldn't maybe say power, but influence and and the people who run these organizations they do have a lot of power it wouldn't make sense for them to 
try to portray themselves as these people who are going against the grain, you know, fighting against these the patriarchal world order that is determined to oppress women, when it's those governments and even sometimes the men in power themselves who are supporting these people, you know, no one is against um, these shelters and, and these organizations that deal with them. No one is against them. Absolutely no one. Not the big corporations, not the governments, not anything. No one supports the male abusers. No one does. You know, so again, this goes against this um, patriarchal theory and that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's that's what I have to say. Thank I, I you, Kate. Like that was very well researched. Uh, you, I really, did you want to say something? Else? Yeah, I, I would just like to say that I do agree with everything and that's correct. I would just like to add that there might be some people who actually think that um, that male abusing female is okay, but they tend to just be hardcore Islamists and not even all of them think that. But just like as a side note, that was important to mention. Well, I just wanted to touch on Kate's argument because um, I feel that a lot of her points kind of ignore the elephant in the room of the physical disparity that is between men and women. And, like, I think that everything that she says kind of works on the baseline that men and women are inherently physically equal. And everything we know about, like, anatomy and physiology proves contrary. Like, we see this with top celebrity, like, top celebrity athletes in female sports being beaten in a simple pickup basketball game by high school boys because men and women aren't physically equal and aren't physically capable. So a lot of the outrage and a lot of where I feel this sympathy towards women comes from is in the fact that if there is a one-on-one -on -one fight between a man and a woman, a woman will typically lose in all cases. And even in the biggest, you know, media outrage case now with the girl who went missing um, when she was with her fiance and no one can find her, we know from when the police pulled them over the first time, she had already admitted to hitting her, him and he already um, was witnessed by someone who called the police hitting her as well. So we know that they fight each other, but only one of them is missing. Why? Because men and women aren't physically equal to each other. So them going head to head in a fight isn't going to have the same exact result. Now that doesn't make it okay. And that's where I do agree with your points. Like there should be resources for male victims of violence. And I do think that a lot of the times because of the way that men are socialized and conditioned about violence towards women, they won't defend themselves even when it is like necessary. And if they do defend themselves, sometimes they will fall victim to the law. So I understand that and I agree with that element of it, but you can't ignore that there's a physical discrepancy. Just like when I was um, working in schools with troubled children, they were very violent towards me. They hit me, they kicked me, they bit me, they did all of these things. But if I were to haul off and pop so them, people would look at me because I'm the adult in the situation and I'm physically more capable than they are. The, um, the thank you for that input. The strength point is something we do have to take into consideration. But what we also have to take into consideration is that women tend to abuse men emotionally and physically to the point where they turn around and they have you know they they are provoked to the point where they can only get back to get out of the situation because what they'll do female abusers will often do is back the man into a corner use the fact that he is genetically programmed and socially programmed and he has this huge axe over his head from the police saying that he shouldn't hit a woman ever 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 and she will back him into a corner and she will use that to abuse him and hit him. And she will use weapons. Uh, she will like attack him with weapons and things like that. And she will do it to provoke him into hitting her. And then she will call but, the police and the police will beat him up. That's, that's right. a typical but, tactic. But even in Hold the on. case which... And it does get the point where you will I mean this scenario with this uh, man who killed this woman presuming it was him because the courts haven't decided yet 
Uh, this is actually something that really kind of plays into uh, our theory of domestic violence, which says that a lot of abuse, like a lot of uh, women who wind up dead in relationships are dead because they are the abusers and they pushed the man so far that he lashed out and with overwhelming strength he killed her. And it may or may not have been an accident. We're not it's not our you know, it's not up to us to decide that. But that's the sort of thing which perpetuates this gap between men and women in the uh death statistics, at least in our opinion. We think that uh you know you it can be the case that since men have absolutely nowhere to run they're pushed to the point where they do it well and i am not saying at all that they're justified in doing that that's not what i'm saying here and uh kaiser is right that this is something that's going to offend a lot of people but at the same time we've seen a lot of statistics saying that the murder rate between men and women used to be a lot more similar and then after women started getting shelters they could escape to it changed but the only place men really have to escape to is the streets. That's about it, really. And now, people, please feel free to contradict me and uh, try to debate me on this. Well, what I was saying is essentially none of anything that you just stated goes contrary to anything that I said. As I said in my initial reply to what Kate was arguing, that I do agree that there are discrepancies, and I already pointed out about how men get pushed to certain points, and when they do respond, there's not a lot of resources or sympathy or understanding on their behalf, which I've stated. So everything of what you said was essentially elaborating on a point I had already made, but nothing that you said has anything to do with my point, which was the reason that people sympathize and empathize, and the reason that a lot of people have more sympathy towards females or view it in a certain way is because of the physical discrepancy which I felt was being ignored. That's all I said. I didn't say anything to contradict what you were saying and I didn't say that any of those things are correct. I'm just saying okay. that we know that one-on-one -on -one, men and women are not equal physically. Well, okay, my... I understand what you're saying. Uh, can I try responding first, please? Go on. It's okay. Yeah, so... Um... I understand what you're saying, and of course I'm not ignoring it. Yes, um, there is a, a physical disadvantage on the woman's part, unfortunately. Um, however, you know, what I would think is that while there is that element, of course, people having more concern for the woman, you know, people being like, like, like if, a, if a man hit a woman, even likely, she people would be like oh my god is she okay you know that that was that he was just being an asshole but like if a if a woman hit a guy really hard you know no one would be no one would care i mean like, he's fine you know he's he's a grown man and things like that but i also feel there is this element of you know and we've just cut off that Sorry, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I did that by accident. Um, yeah, so people having like a bigger empathy for, you know, women and, you know, it's just, it's just a general thing. And like, you know, that wouldn't, it wouldn't really, you know, okay, let's say, for example, you have a male abuser and you have a female victim, right? She'll, she'll get a lot of sympathy, right? Um, but no, if you have if you have the opposite, if you have a female abuser and a male victim, right? People will have a really bad like throughout history and even today, people have just been humiliating, you know, male victims of domestic violence. You know, in in the past, you know, like throughout the the 17th and the 18th and the 19th century, they used to do this thing where they would publicly humiliate him by putting him on a, like a donkey and making him ride it backwards there was that was completely unnecessary i mean there's one thing to have less empathy for a male victim of domestic violence and then there's another thing to just completely humiliate him which is horrific right but you know that's kind of what we see in 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 today in today's you know society that you know if if a, let's say for example a guy 
Um, like I'll give you that example of what's his name. I think his name was Paul Jenner. His girlfriend, like, beat him to the like several times, beat him to the point of injury. And during the last time, she beat him so much that he went went into a coma, and she, he was taken to hospital, and she was arrested, and he died. Like a few days later. Now this particular case was on TV, right? So everyone knew about it, right? And she only got, I think, three to five months in prison because the judge said it cannot be proven that, you know, him dying was linked to her beating him, despite the fact that she literally put him in the hospital, right? So of course, there might be and of course there is, you know, a physical uh, discrepancy between men and women. However, even even during the situations when women severely, severely um, injure men, they still get, you know, a much lesser sentence. They still aren't seen as bad, you know. You know, today the fashionable excuse is that they were probably defending themselves even when there's no evidence of that. And statistics actually show that not all of it can be attributed to self-defense, right? So I still think that while there is that element of people having more concern about a woman because she's smaller, I think it's also because of this genuine misandry or this genuine lower empathy for men. Yeah, that's well, feel. two things can be true at the same time. A and B, I don't think that we can take sentencing as a metric for anything because I can tell you in my own experience with domestic violence where I was in a situation where I ended up hospitalized and I didn't even report my former spouse, a, an out an onlooker reported what they saw and so it wasn't even I didn't even have to say anything. Multiple people Reported. I was in the hospital, and even still, with all the evidence, with all the texts and everything, that individual got a little bit of jail time and had to do like some counseling class that could be taken online. So, domestic violence cases, generally speaking, aren't really that highly prosecuted. So, it's hard for me to say, like, oh, well, because she was a woman, she got three to four years. When I've experienced my own case in several cases through the course of that marriage where, you know, it seemed to be a little lax on the repercussion side. So. Well, it is very hard to go from uh, one case to extrapolate that to the entirety of society. So it's 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 not really good to um, like use anecdotes as statistics. But uh, before I. Like, um, before you chipped in before, I was actually going to mention a second point uh, that's actually, I think, a lot more important to what I was saying, which was that women will use proxy violence and they will use more underhanded methods than men when they're actually trying to kill a man or, you know, even get him beaten up. I've had first had experience of this myself where. Uh, a woman's favorite weapon in my personal experience when she's trying to abuse someone is to basically go over to her male friends, tell her male friends that this man over here is trying to hurt me or he's creepy or he makes me feel unsafe. And then the man goes over there and quote unquote deals with it for her. Um, I have a question. How come it's you know, beyond the lines of this conversation for me to use my personal and oh, no, no, I wasn't oh. saying that. I wasn't saying that at all. Okay, but then you follow that immediately with a personal anecdote. So I was just a little confused. Mm. Oh, no, no. No, I meant, I was, uh, I didn't mean that uh, your personal experiences are invalid and my personal experiences are valid. I'm just saying that we can't really extrapolate to the whole of society. Uh, what I'm saying is that I have statistics as well that back this up. Basically, um, Warren Farrell's book has a bunch of citations on this. And we've got a couple of citations on the uh, citation list. 
dealing with uh, women will mostly use proxy violence and mostly use like poison and things to kill people. Uh, you know, if they're trying to kill someone. Uh, we also have citations showing that uh, the majority of women who beat their partners were not abused, uh, at least not by their partners. But we, uh, we obviously, you need to be as careful of my anecdotes as I am of yours. Oh, I'm not saying that yeah, your anecdotes be mine or vice versa. Uh, I'm sorry if I gave the, the false impression that that's what I was saying. Like there's yeah, one actually one anecdote, no, no, well, one uh, thing I would like to add is that even though all, of, yeah, you, you guys are correct, I would just like to add that, um, that in addition to proxy violence, a lot of women, of course, not most women, but if there's a domestic violence situation, um, a lot of the time, the, if a woman wants to abuse a man, she can use the state as part of a tool of abusing him, right? And in in most in many 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 countries, right? Usually because of the Duluth model, right? Um, and a lot of men cannot do that, which they should not be able to do, by the way. Um, that would be horrible. And but I do think it's horrible because if a woman domestic violence abuses can actually do that, and that's also like very important information. Just like it's important to mention that women are, on average, physically weaker. Uh, in general, right? Uh, just as it's important to mention that the, the law isn't, men and women are not physically equal, they are not also legally equal in the circumstance either. And this is an important addition to, to the conversation. But that's kind of typical in, in situations where people aren't physically equal, like in terms of the law. Like, for example, uh, if someone is a teenager and they're fighting their parents and, you know, teenagers at a certain age, they're 16 years old, they're fit and healthy, they can really do some damage. But if the parent responds adequately to them, they're still going to be held to a higher extent of the law because they're physically more capable in a lot of the cases with children and also they're in a position of caregiving so a lot of the times laws aren't necessarily equal when they view the victims or the people involved to have discrepancies in physicality yeah of course but like my point is also this if that um if that like the idea of that the woman should man should always be arrested in uh, such in, in circumstances where and uh, there is an intimate violence between a man and a woman, regardless about who is hitting who and for whatever reason, right? Um, so, like, if they basically is a reciprocal, the only if the only man is arrested, in the reciprocal is like presuming that the woman is in is the is the is in, in, innocent and the man is the aggressor is not right, absolutely not. And one example of that would be like if a woman were to hit beat a man with a baseball bat, then he would actually be arrested if she got a splinter. From the baseball bat, because then it would be both parties sustain the damage, um, and yeah, and, and I do believe that that that, that there is a dis discrepancy if you see uh, with, with physics, but like to have only women having all the protection, right? It's not, it's, it's not like equalizing. It's not like handling it in a way that is in any way fair and nor just. Just to add on what Jay Will said, um, so Athena, I do 100% get where you're coming from, but I just like to say I think today it's a bit too unbalanced. Like, let me just quickly share a story. Um, you can find it in the in that um, movie, um, The Red Pill by Cassie J. Um, again, if you don't like Cassie J, that's fine. I'm just saying. When you when you go look in that movie, you see there was this guy who was talking about his own um, experience with domestic abuse, right? And I think his name was Dean Esme or something else. But you know, he was talking about his his experience, and what he said is that um, when his wife or girlfriend 
uh, would beat him up, like she would beat him up to the point where he started bleeding. And he would go to the police station while he was still bleeding. And they would literally just laugh at him and ignore him. And one time, one police officer told him something that really stuck in his mind. She told him, uh, sorry, he, he told him or she, I, I, I'm not sure what the gender of the police officer was, but they told him that if she starts hitting you, you better get out of there so fast because if she breaks a nail while she's hitting you, we will come and we will arrest you, you know, which is, is insane. I mean, it sounds like something out of a Monty Python sketch, you know, and that was far from the not uh, far from the only case right he also talked about there was this time that you know there was this guy he knew who would get beaten up by his girlfriend or wife and whenever she would start doing that he would walk outside and stand in his like driveway just so that the neighbors could could see that it was her beating him and not the other way around because you know if they heard the sound they might think that it was him beating her and they would call the police and he would get arrested, right? So that that's literally all he could do. And of course, they didn't call the police in, to help him. They just left him to, you know, get beaten up, right? Which is pretty sad, right? So like, this is the, this is the response. Like, if you actually look at all the resources, and I can even share some with you, that when male domestic, uh, male, male domestic violence victims, they call the police, they call the hotlines, they call anyone, the response that they get is usually, um, you know, you must have hit her. Like, And it's really disappointing because sometimes they'll even call a hotline that specializes in this kind of thing. And then they'll, they'll literally try and gaslight him into admitting that he was actually the one hitting her, right? And they'll even say that, you know, the society around them wasn't helping them at all and that they weren't able to find help, you know? I mean, look at what happened to Earl Silverman, right, and Aaron Peasy. If anyone doesn't know who those people are, just ask me and I'll talk, to, talk about them. But, you know, basically there is a lot, there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a, a really deeply entrenched hatred for male domestic violence victims and any man that would dare try and kind of, of of course this is not my own opinion but like this is the opinion of people who feel like this but there's like a deep hatred for men who would try and usurp the help that is being given to women right so okay i don't okay sorry um equality for all i of course it's not a hundred percent of the time but it's it happens a lot is what i'm saying so I mean, in most countries, like even even developed countries like Australia, UK, US, there's very, very, even Canada, there's very, very few domestic violence shelters for men, but, you know, an abundance for women. Right. So, you know, that's 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 basically it. Yeah, we we do have a lot of uh, men here. And quite probably on men's, well, actually, definitely on men's lib as well, who have experiences of being beaten and abused by women and then the police doing nothing. Uh, we saw some of their stories in the Chuck Derry AMA, uh, which is, uh, it should be in the link of this video if you're watching it uh, later, because uh, I've just added it. Uh, if you refresh the video, you might be able to see it, but I'm not sure it if you'll update until after the video is uh, basically up permanently and then stop streaming. But uh, go through that and look at some of the stories they're telling him and look at how he just totally ignores them. I would also like, like to add to this is that when you good at you mention Australia, for example, because that's a country they actually have more domestic violence uh, help or shelters for abused animals than for abused men, even though those are mainly f funded by uh, male taxpayers. And they also have to fund shit like Clementine Ford writing why, um, why Corona writes into killing men quickly enough, right? And all becomes like that doesn't deserve to fucking exist. Um, um, and also, like, uh, and therefore, uh, the solution is to be a men's rights single issue voter because if a government allows this to happen, then it's not the government that treats me as a human being. Because a female supremacist state, then. Yeah, 
Now, Blue, you've been awfully quiet. So are you still with us? P pardon, I couldn't uh, hear. Uh, just asking Blue if he's still with us because he's been awfully quiet. But uh, he does have work, I think. He may just be listening in. Okay, so uh, does I'm anyone I, I, else... I, I, can, I can talk very briefly. What's up? Oh, sure. We were just... Uh, we were just uh, talking about uh, how the uh, domestic abuse uh, system is structured and uh, how the uh, Duluth model is set up. Uh, Athena was arguing that uh, we have to gender, uh, well, I, I think she was arguing that we have to gender domestic, our approach to domestic violence due to how strong men are compared to women. But uh, I don't think we need no, to. No, I, I just want to clarify. I wasn't saying that we should. I'm saying that's why people do. Right. No, I get okay. that. Yeah, so I, I think Athena was just saying she kind of understands where they're coming from. Um, I think that the law on paper should be gender neutral. And then, you know, aggravating or mitigating factors can be taken into account in court. Although I don't think gender should be considered either an aggravating or mitigating factor. Uh, but I do think that laws should be uh, gender neutral um, on paper. And the Duluth model, the reason why the men's lib users are so surprised is because the Duluth model follows traditional feminist academic theory. And so there's a reason why male victims are not recognized under the Duluth model. And it's because male victims were not recognized under traditional feminist theory. You know, they, they've got the occasional lip service oh yeah by the way it happens to men too but for the most part the issue was completely neglected and so that's why the ama went the way it went we weren't surprised and that's the thing i knew what was going to happen before it happened i think we all did uh the moment you say chuck derry <laughs> doing an ama in uh, men's lib if you know who chuck derry is then you know it's not going to go very well unless all the men in there are somehow not abuse victims. It's, uh, it's basically his modus operandi is to uh, just totally ignore male victims of domestic violence. And yeah, it's, I feel like we need to give male domestic violence uh, charities a lot more power than they have. But it's very hard to see how we can do that when whenever the conversation steers into domestic violence in the courts or in the uh, like a government committee or anything like that, uh, the uh, feminist lobbies and all of that will exclude these male domestic violence uh, charities from their official meetings with the government. And they, you know, it's just uh, they have all the power. The solution is to use if a government won't include those and will include the female ones, then the government is clearly a female supremacist government, and therefore people should vote against it. And therefore, um, you should look at it when it comes to politics, you look at them, are they want to extend domestic violence uh, uh, prevention or help for domestic violence victims to men? It doesn't mean that they should have equal funding, they should be not men who are generally tend to be 40 percent right should at least think it has four percent of the funding right i'm not saying they should get equally funded but i'm just saying they should more than they currently are right and if you bring out these politicians and if they claim they're going to do something about it then that should be supported and if they don't they should not be supported and i believe that the best way is to just act uh politically as a men's rights single issue voter and that's the only way they will listen because they used to, if people care about other things more then they don't have to care so they don't the problem with all of these, like, suggestions you're making is, like, laws don't really tend to change unless there's an actual push for them to. And then you want to argue about, oh, well, a lot of these laws come from feminist theories and all these things, because that's who actually advocated for themselves to make the laws what they are. Men in mass aren't doing that. So I think to say that we should start from a legal level is kind of difficult because that's just not how laws move or how laws get passed. You see like the groups, the minority groups, whether it be, you know, any minority group that has any type of legal protection are typically the ones who advocated 
to to gain those legal protections. And you can see that in contrast with like a lot of Native American communities who struggle to get a lot of advocacy because their numbers are so small. So I think it really has to be a grassroots type of push because just to say, oh, the law should be this. Yeah, well, who's spending their time lobbying for that? You know what I mean? Well, the thing with that is the people who change the laws are the representatives we vote in, senators, presidents. To get laws changed the way we want them, we need to vote in the people who stand for our views, which, firstly, currently is not the easiest thing to find in the political world. And secondly, we need to get people to vote for that. And whether we'd like to admit it or not, one of our biggest problems as a movement is getting people to realize what they can actually change. In a lot of countries, there still is enough of a male voting population to make that kind of change. It just doesn't happen because they're all split up with their different opinions and beliefs. Well, well, the the only reason that political leaders campaign on certain ideas is because they think enough people care about it. If enough people express that that's something they're passionate about, then more people will take that on in their campaigns towards being elected. But right now, if no one says shit about it, how are they going to know that that's something they should advocate for? If if the loudest voices in the conversation are saying the antithesis of that, which are like feminists and other groups who don't support those types of things, who's going to be the lone wolf to stand in front of a quiet room with no people in the audience and say, yeah, I'm going to campaign on this when no one's asking them to. Nobody. That's not how it works. So if people make a, their voice heard, like this is something we want, this is advocacy that we want, then politicians and people who are running to be elected will put that on their campaign if they feel that that's something that's passionate for them. And then those people can then vote for it. Yes, exactly, and that's the reason why. Currently, it's not in there because we don't have people supporting that. Like we all do, we don't have enough people supporting that for them to care. I think. I think what is important right now. I think what is it really important right right now is a little bit of conscious raising and a little bit of raising of awareness. Because okay, here's 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 my my view on things, and of course you can disagree with me. Um, but what I think right now is that people are really, really, really um, brought up with um, the patriarchy theory and the misogyny theory, right? That, you know, we're living in like a patriarchal, misogynistic world and that kind of thing that women are like continuously pressed down by men and men are just, you know, they have, um, to quote Peggy McIntosh, an invisible knapsack of privileges, right? So I think that if people approach it from that point of view, they're always going to see, you know, we need to protect women first and foremost, you know, and that kind of thing. However, if we do a bit of conscious raising like we're doing today, to actually show using studies and using empirical data that actually um, it's not really connected to to patriarchy or, or things like that, or at least not in the U.S. or a lot of Western countries, right? Even Even in countries like Germany, that's not the case, right? So it's it's not been that, you know, that for a long time, right? You know, people have always been against domestic violence towards women in most communities. You know, even when you read the Bible, they're against domestic violence. You know, the Bible is pretty extreme, right? So, um, sorry, Christians. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so like, I think I think what is one thing that's really important right now is just to do some conscious raising, right? So so just basically to continue the same thing that we're doing now. Of course, I really appreciate um, you know Ma and um, the other activists who are doing you know they're they're part of the national coalition of men and they're doing actual like legislative activism. Right now, I don't really do that in Kenya because I'm pretty much the only person here that thinks about such right so I don't I, there's no organization that does things like that here or at least not if I check but um I'm, I'm I just think that the conscious raising is is really important and it's a powerful thing right because it was also something that feminists did in the beginning they would also do a lot more um raising of awareness about certain issues right so that was the entire 
that was something that really was big in the 1970s. You know, that's when they really wanted to raise consciousness about domestic violence, you know, and that's what really made it to be seen as, you know, a really big societal, structural, systemic issue that it was today. You know, people in the past, they viewed it as horrible and wrong, but they didn't think that it was a structural thing because, you know, anyone who did it was actually punished and that kind of thing. But, you know, so I, I just I just really think conscious raising is really important in this situation. Yeah, uh, one thing I would like to say to the men's lippers uh, that I think they should think about is if the patriarchy is really the cause of all of men's problems, then why is it that the people who seem to have the ear of the patriarchy and the only ones who seem to be able to get it to do anything are the feminists? How is I it? Will, I will point out that men's lib generally does not believe in patriarchy theory. I've but been on there not? for a while. They generally don't are you know. Sure? From what I've seen, oh. a lot of men's lib blames the patriarchy for a lot of the so called patriarchy for a lot of men's problems. That it puts a lot of social pressure on men to stay in their role and for women to stay in their role, and that's how it's supposed to be. That these are the roles of society, and it's the problem of the so called patriarchy in order that the roles exist in the way they do. So they do believe in patriarchy, then? They believe the current... What would be called patriarchy by feminists, the cultural status quo, is what they blame. They blame the cultural status quo. Mainly the rich elite guys who sit at the top. Generally, patriarchy refers to the rich white elite. Not men in general though it often is interpreted that way by newer feminists i think that is a lot more clearly described as an oligarchy than a patriarchy it's or it, it, yeah or it including everyone it would probably be a kiriarchy um you know if 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 gender is or uh uh non-economic power is a big factor then i would call it a lot easier to describe it as an oppressive kiriarchy um but it really from my perspective looks a whole lot more like rule by wealth rather than rule by the father i mean i've been around a long time and known a lot of very powerless uh very um uh disenfranchised and disadvantaged humans that happen to be male so you know the uh the idea of a hierarchy based on on the pater on the on the on fatherhood on the know, patriarch I, I, yeah that it just you know doesn't hold enough water to say yeah here's the problem it's well, elitism not patriarchy pretty much yeah the the well, elites just happen to be mostly rich white men whose great-grandfathers owned, like, Standard Oil. Yeah, and who, who are well, those rich white men to marry to, usually? I yep. think the patriarchy, at least in the way that I view it, is not, like, something that somebody just created one day. I think it's rooted in what's believed to be the laws of nature, the laws of, like, biology, yes. and how we choose partners, and how we how we have moved and progressed through society and patriarchy meaning that men are the leaders of society meaning patriarchy. that men are leaders of the home leaders of the country leaders of wars leaders of all of these things and it's not just something like oh men just got together one day and decided we're the patriarch it's it's the concept and the notion that goes back to our earliest human foundation that has built upon and built upon for generations and generations and generations until this day i don't yes. think it's like yeah. i don't think it's yeah, like that's, something that's that's the thought academic of. explanation pa patriarchy is generally the idea of that historically speaking men have been the leaders of society and women well, have had generally been underneath them They've mostly held political power in. 
Yes. You know, okay. Uh, I'm it's just a little give... bit more. Oh, okay. You know, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, let me just quickly give my rundown of what I think. And, um, you know, okay, here's the thing. I did, I do come from like a radical feminist background. You know, I was really into like, you know, smash the patriarchy and, you know, everything is set up to benefit men and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, the the more I began to read into this topic, um, you know, I think I think that especially in the beginning, for example, um, patriarchy was the most convenient way of society. And, and I'll give you a, a reason why I'm saying that. Right. So let's say, for example, you're a woman living in, you know, before <laughs> before Christ, right? And you, um, you know, most of the time you're pregnant because not only did women have to have a lot of children because a lot of children died in childbirth, they had to also make up for the women who are dying in childbirth. Of course, this wasn't the fault of, you know, men depriving them of food or anything like that. No, it's just because, you know, childbirth for a long time has been really difficult and really um hard and you know it's something that could kill you right so it was really dangerous right so because of this a lot of women had to have a lot of children right to make up for the children that died and also the other women who passed away right so because of this a woman would spend most of her time you know taking care of young children and you know also having to you know, spend time pregnant, right? And you know, when you're pregnant, you can't really do a lot of work, right? So, and also remember that this was a time when we didn't have technology and so society wasn't very, very secure, right? In the past, they didn't really have what we, what we call the police, right? You know, society was a lot more dangerous than how it is today, right? So let's say, for example, you're a woman and you have a husband, your husband not only has to do most of the difficult agriculture, you know, because back then most of the work was, you know, people living in a small plot of land and having their own little farm, right? You will, he would have to do most of the heavy work in the farm. He would have to protect you from wild animals, from invaders, from thieves, from whatever. And you as a woman, you couldn't do most of the really difficult farm work and you couldn't protect yourself, especially if you were pregnant, right? So this naturally became that, you know, men had to be the providers and the protectors of women, right? And of course, this eventually devolved into, because men have to have this massive responsibility for women, they also have to be able to lead women because, you know, if you're pregnant and you're taking care of your kids most of the time, it doesn't really leave enough um, time for power playing, you know, time for you to be a, a president or a prime minister or a, or, a, or a king or anything like that, you know. So it was mostly men who was doing those things, you know. And of course, this devolved into gender roles, which I still think are really, really restrictive. And I don't fully agree with them. But I do admit that to some extent, they do have some bearing on, you know, the physical reality of what was there for a long time. Right. And, you know, you could also argue that women didn't have to get married. You know, if they didn't want to, they couldn't, they should, they shouldn't have gotten married or anything like that. But, you know, be honest, like if you were a woman in that day and age, there was no contraception, right? So you were either going to have to stay celibate all your life and you'd have to work all those difficult jobs like being a blacksmith. And again, women were allowed <laughs> to work. It's not that they were just banned from being blacksmiths or anything like that. They were allowed to, you know, and we have gilded records that show this, right? So either, you know, there was being a celibate blacksmith all your life or you could get married to someone whom you actually liked and have children with them, right? So because of this, there was a lot of responsibility put on men. But now here's where me and some feminists start to deviate. They think that those um, privileges that men had in the past, which were responses to their responsibilities, they think that that was male privilege and that that, that was society being set up to benefit men and not women, for example, let's say if if um if the if the son is given 
the priority of inheritance or the what is called uh, the male primogeniture. I think that's how you say it. Um, it meant that, you know, society wants women to be poor and your society wants women to not be powerful or anything like that. That's not true. The reason why he was given that priority is because he was expected to get married sometimes to someone of not even of his own choosing and support her for the rest of his life and any children that she has. Right. You know, so if he had to be the leader of his family, it was also because in many cultures, if the wife or the kids did anything wrong, he would be held accountable for it. You know, this like the the um, UK and the US society took this to the extreme when they said that if your wife is fined, you have to pay the fine. If your wife commits a crime, you have to go to jail. You know, they took that to the extreme. Right. So uh, actually, if you actually look at it, like a lot of these so-called male privileges are actually just male responsibilities. Right. And there were a lot of things. That's why I'm saying you can't just look at one side of the story. You have to look at all the advantages that women have had throughout history. You know, women never had to die in war. Women mostly weren't being as as tortured as men were by the state, you know, with all these horrible, you know, public tortures and everything like that. Women were almost never subjected. Sometimes they were even barred from having that punishment given to them right so there's there was a lot you know that that people well, you know don't consider when they talk about this so that's what i feel well i think that to say you can't look at one side of the picture is kind of an irrelevant statement in this conversation because i don't feel that anybody here has done that and i think that most all of us were just saying that we when we're talking about patriarchy we are talking about the concept and the idea that men are the leaders of society and their household oh, yeah, etc i'm not saying all, that, not saying that people things, here have been doing that but, i'm not saying that i'm just saying that other people like maybe for example maybe yeah. some radical feminists they had been the one to look at things from only one side of the picture but not anyone here so right. i'm sorry for that question. So, yeah so so I'm saying, like, agreeing with all the things that you're saying, when people say that we live in a, in a society where, you know, it still has a lot of semblance and elements of patriarchy, and because we look at the world leaders, we look at these things, it's not that we're saying, like, who has all of the privilege, it's that we're saying that we still have semblance of the past, and when we say things like, oh, this is an element of patriarchy backfiring, such as like child support and all of these things, we're saying that these ideas that men should be burdened with this level of responsibility on behalf of women comes from the same ideas from long ago that women are the caregivers and men are the providers. It's not saying that it's privilege, ha, 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 blew up in your face. We're saying that these concepts are notions that come from way, way, way back in human history that we are still attached to. I kind of think we need to draw a strong distinction here between um, small p patriarchy, which is just ruled by men, and large p patriarchy which is patriarchy theory which says men have ruled all of society for the benefit of men exclusively and have used that power and privilege to oppress women since the dawn of time which is demonstrably not true and i think we need to basically take a good hard look at any you know claim that stems from that because Duluth model and several other major uh, feminist talking points and uh, theories and like uh, laws and things like that are designed with the assumptions of patriarchy capital P patriarchy uh, while oh. living in a society that may be small p patriarchy 
Well, that's while that's true and that's mostly relevant in a lot of the discussions we have, it, I don't think that's particularly relevant when someone in this chat is explaining that no men's lib in, in this context doesn't view patriarchy as the reason why these things are happening. They're saying in the way that you just described, the big P, they're saying patriarchy as in the ideas and the notions that come from uh, concepts long ago that's what they're saying so in these types of conversations like the one we're having right now where someone is explaining to you that no we're not standing by patriarchy theory we're just saying that patriarchy in its true core as a concept is why a lot of the problems are occurring okay but we need to first examine um one thing right because you this is um, mean by patriarchy is the question because you're just you're using patriarchy as the reason but what do you mean then? sorry for interrupting who was that to I, uh, to you you're saying patriarchy is the reason for all the things that are happening what do you describe no 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 patriarchy? i was saying somebody earlier was explaining the men's lib subreddit i'm not a part of that I was just saying, I think that that's what they were referring to. Uh, that wasn't my argument. Fair enough. Okay, so here's the thing. What Here's what um, I would like to to ask. Um, okay, not to Athena, but, well, it's more of a rhetorical ask than anything. But, like, we need to probably question, you know, ourselves to see if, you know, this so-called patriarchy was done to, 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 to benefit men at the expense of women. Because, okay, here's the thing. If, for example, patriarchy was formed because, um, you know, unfortunately women could not engage in the same things that men could engage in a long time ago. Um, but, you know, the, the central feature of feminism, especially radical feminism, is that, you know, Patriarchy, misogyny, they're all tied together because, you know, society was set up to benefit men and that, you know, men have the same privilege that um, that's, I'm just giving an example here. Um, white people in um, maybe the U.S., you know, that, you know, white people, they did do certain things a long time ago to benefit themselves over people of other races and you know they exploited them and that kind of thing so a lot of the theories that radical feminists have ties into this you know that men have all the power because they specifically created society to benefit men at the expense of women and women are just the oppressed underdogs you know who everybody hates and who you know everybody um, is distrustful of and you know, the same way that, like, okay, here's the thing. Maybe you, maybe some people here have not read into a lot of radical feminist theory. But when you read the works of people like Simone de Beauvoir and Andrea Dworkin, right, you begin to see that a lot of radical feminists, they just genuinely do believe that society hates women and that society is, benef is, is benefiting from the exploitation of women and specifically men are benefiting from the exploitation of women, you know. So that is where I disagree with a lot of feminists because, you know, I, I always have this joke. If, <laughs> if men really set up society to benefit them, they miss the mark on almost everything, you know. <laughs> like, it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's either that men didn't set up society to benefit them, that they only did certain things to benefit themselves as rela in relation to their obligations as, you know, as fathers and husbands, right? Or they did set up society to benefit them and they just, they're really, really, really incompetent at it, you know, which is, which is really unlikely, you know? Because, you know, you know to me, you know, um, when we look at a concept, let's say, for example, of a feminist saying this is male privilege backfiring, I would argue that it's not male privilege backfiring. It's actually a feature of this so-called patriarchy because it was never set up to benefit men at the expense of women. It was done, if anything, for women's benefit so that women wouldn't have to, you know, um, suffer all the same things. As, as, as men were suffering, right? You know, women, most of the time, if, if they were married, especially in a stable marriage, they wouldn't have to worry about, 
you know, things like earning an income or at least being the primary Anna. You know, women wouldn't have to worry too much about going and dying in war or protecting their families from a foreign enemy. You know, women wouldn't have to worry about, you know, um, whether their children were going to eat or or anything. That was most of the things that men had to care about, you know. And and if the husband wasn't there to protect the the woman, it was some other guy who was doing it, right? I don't think that those are examples of male privilege backfiring. I think that that was the intention. That was always the intention to pro- protect and provide for women, you know. So, you know, but, but that's where really, that's where, you know, you kind of see yeah. that. You know, I don't think so, the claim is that it's male privilege. I think they say it's patriarchy backfiring. No, but it's it's also I've seen. Okay, I've seen a lot of feminists say this is just male privilege backfiring. Like, let me give you an example because we were talking about the concept of domestic violence. They're like, you know, this is male privilege backfiring because you know men are seen as the top dogs in society and that women are seen as so inferior that they can't possibly. Uh, be violent towards a man, you know, because like it's embarrassing for a man to be beaten up by a woman because like women are so inferior. But, you know, to me, that doesn't that doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, like I brought up this topic earlier, if it was really true that, you know, women were the hated, like I'm using the word minority in quotes. I I think I, I hope you guys understand what I mean by this. But like, if women were like really the hated minority, you know, they would be saying they would be saying that like violence against men is worse than, than violence against women. And then they would be saying that, you know, women are much more violent than it, than women, you know, actually being violent. You know, like you can see this, like, for example, like, um, you know, the Nazis, like they would constantly portray like the Jews as being really violent, despite the fact that most of them were not. You know, or that African American men were like really violent again, despite the fact that most of them are not. So like, there's not been a single oppressed class in history that was seen as incapable of violence, right? So let's say, for example, like we were living in a really misogynistic society that was based around the protection and care of men and the degradation and hatred of women, right? We'd actually be seeing the opposite. We'd be seeing much more care being given to male victims of domestic violence. We'd be seeing like hotlines reading, um, uh, not hotlines, sorry, what, what is it called? Uh, bellboards saying, you know, um, end violence against men. You know, you'd see people saying, stop killing men. You know, you'd be seeing things like that, right? So, it, it, you know, so so this this thing that, you know, it's because we live in a misogynistic world and everyone just loves men and everyone hates women is the reason why people are really, really, really like toxic towards male victims of domestic violence. I just I just don't agree with it. I mean, I just I just do not see it. You know, it's not based on misogyny. You know, like if you look at Richard Felson's studies the fact that they were more concerned about a woman being beaten, it's not because they were like, haha, dumb woman, you know, we hate women, but we just don't want her to get beaten up. No, they were really concerned about a guy hitting his, his wife at a, at, a, at, a, at a conference or a party or something like that. It, it never stemmed from a hatred of women, you know, or anything like that. So I, I just don't agree with those theories that some people have, right? Yeah, I, I do really, really uh, take issue with the idea that it's backfiring, because the assumption there is that men designed the system to benefit them. But if the system is, as one of its fundamental components, forcing men to go off to war and selecting them randomly across the country using the draft, then how is that backfiring? I mean, that seems like a feature rather than a uh, bug. Exactly what I was saying. Like, that's always been the the goal. It's, it's, it's not like um, men were like, oh, we're so much better than women and we are out to oppress women. Oh, oopsie, that means that we're going to have to go to war. No, like, that's never been a thing. 
You know, it's it's never been about a hatred of women or anything about that. You know, like I had a feminist on on Twitter who was talking about this, and you know, she's a she's a very sweet lady, right? But you know, she was saying that the reason why men um, was sent to war and women were not is because you know people view you know women as weak and that kind of thing. Again, I don't really think that's based on misogyny either, because even if your argument is that women shouldn't go to war because women are physically weaker than men, I mean, that's somewhat true, you know, not that not that I think that women should be banned from entering military service. That's not what I think. But, you know, of course, women are not going to be able to do all the same physical things that men are going to do. Right. And. Women don't even really want this, right? So if you look at an example like um, Israel, which has service for women, right? Um, For women, it's only two years. For men, it's two and a half years, right? It's two and a half years. And even, even if you're a woman and you enter, you can also leave for citing religious reasons, right? Um, Because, like, if you look at the Old Testament or the Torah, it's actually only men going to war, not women, right? So, for example, if you're a Jewish woman, you... Religious reasons are only for people attending religious schools or who are a religious minority. That's basically the only way that ever works out. Okay, but if you're a woman, you can also say it's for religious reasons. Right. I, I, would you think, can't say that. I would think the better thing to focus on is just that we as uh, as we as societally we need to start appreciating some of the things that men are uh, doing for for women generally, like well, well being the majority the is, uh, of the top just, jobs, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, the thing is that it's generally like expected of them. That's just what they're expected to do so they're just kind of it's kind of seen as doing their job a good example is you don't thank the police for making sure everyone's following the speed limit you just expect them to do it and if they're doing it they're just doing what they're supposed to well i would i would think you can thank a police officer if he's trying to help somebody out or be be uh, delivering fair judgment yeah, That'd if they're going, thing. like, out of their way to do things, they're generally thanked for it because it's considered above and beyond what they're supposed to be doing. But if you just do what you're seen as what you're supposed to do, it's generally a thankless task. Well, that's usually with men. I, I don't think that's I've seen in women doing what is expected of them being not Healthcare thanked, work? Not yeah, that's not true because if you look at... <laughs> I know that there's this phenomenon of people like a mom will do their kid's hair and it's like another Tuesday, a dad will do their daughter's hair and it'll be like 5 million views on YouTube or like a dad will get praise for taking their kids to the doctor. Whereas like a mom's just kind of like, yeah, you take your kids to the doctor. And I know like a lot of men who like say, well, I take care of my kids. Like, like that's like an additional point like oh you shouldn't have to inherently take care of your children so i do kind of agree that about the thankless job with people performing things that are traditionally seen as their gender roles being basically an expectation and i have to admit that i kind of do hold that sentiment as well like but then again i'm more of a traditional person so I, th- yeah, I think I we we don't have to praise them every step of the way, but just once in a while, just being like, hey, thanks for doing this, even if it's your job, it, it can go a long way for a lot of people. And yeah, this is, you need to be careful about it becoming uh, meaningless because it's being praised too much. But that's that, that's why you do it with the thankless jobs and the thankless tasks that people do. If you're, yeah, doing what's expected of you as a person is generally like, oh, they're doing what they're supposed to. It's, you don't, generally, you, you'll thank someone if they're doing something extraordinary 
or if it's the expectation to thank them. So a lot of people will. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree yeah, with the same here. Um, you know, because, okay, here's the thing. I'm a woman, right? And I hope to ha one day have children, right? And I really, really hope that if I do end up with a male partner, people won't do that annoying thing where they're like, you know, they see me take care of my kids for like eight hours a week. And then like, if he plays for them for two minutes, they'd be like, oh my God, you're so lucky. He's such a catch. Like he's the best father ever. Because I will literally scream, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about fighting sexism against both genders. It's not okay when it's a man. It's not okay when it's a woman, right? I, I also think that, you know, mothers or, or um, you know, female caregivers or female you know, sisters or everything like that, they should also get praised for taking care of of children and, you know, doing the things that they're supposed to do. Um, I, I understand that a lot of these issues go both ways, right? So, like, I just, I just don't like how it's just expected for girls to do, like, house chores and sometimes it's not expected for men. Like, I'm, I'm Indian and luckily I didn't have a problem with this, but... You know, some people would tell me that when they were growing up, like, um, if there's, like, a grandma who's in the house, and then there's, like, a young girl, like, sitting maybe just watching TV, and her brother is also sitting with her and watching TV, the grandma is going to come to her and tell her, why, why are you just sitting there? Why don't you go make some noodles for your brother? And, like, why, why can't he go make noodles for her? Like, why does she have to do everything, like... It's, you know, I, I don't like this, this like common stereotype of like, you know, men sitting on the couch and, and, you know, women doing everything like it's, it's just wrong. You know, it's, it's, it's it shouldn't well, happen. I think with that, it's generally uh, in, in the, well, in a traditionalist sense, the grandmother is trying to give uh, the girl the opportunity to learn a skill that she thinks is valuable to her, which is, well, home ec, basically. And the boy is, is going to learn a trade or any kind of education or something. That's that's what a traditionalist view would be. I don't think it necessarily has to be like that. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, if, if the boy later on just keeps doing play stuff and not uh, actually doing any chores or anything that is remotely seen as... Uh, contributing to 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 the household or to studies or something like, then, then yeah, yeah exactly again it's it's, it's pretty true. it's pretty it's pretty stupid you know for these like these expectations these days i understand that you know in the past like there were only certain things that men could do because you know of of the physical nature of the work but like these days it's 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 just stupid you know because like in my family for example all of my brothers are like dependent on like the female family members and most of the female family members have jobs you know and still yet like the female family members are expected to do like housework and manage the home but like the men you know they get to have like their their resting time and even even if they don't even have jobs like it it makes no sense you know so it's like the exact opposite of most of the west exactly you know <laughs> that's yeah that's still wrong i, I would agree of with course. that yeah. No, I just feel that wrong is subjective because if some people choose to, I just think equality is important in relationships. And some people may view that as a 50-50 divide of all tasks, all workload, all bills, all home chores. But some may think 50-50 is, okay, you hold down the home and I do you know, the economic stuff and that and that's you doing half the work and I'm doing the other half. It's yeah. still 50 50. So I feel like every individual couple should have the agency to decide how they want to break up the tasks. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, it's like what was described yeah. was the the women being the workers and the, the homemakers. Exactly. And that's, that's... I mean, that's doing, doing all the work while the men are just well, if, if the men are really good at at giving the women, uh, well, uh, leisure, I would say, uh, the relieving stress, to say it nicely. 
No, no, no. They're, they're well, siblings. Maybe, maybe they don't do maybe. any. They don't do oh, anything like that. Oh, sorry, no, that's not right. Uh, yeah. but if, oh if, if my god. Siblings, to make it a little more serious, you know, Athena, what you were just saying about uh, granting individual persons the agency to make adult decisions about, you know, how life is going to be lived as a couple, how life is going to be lived as a as a family. Um, you know, there. That's, in my view, that's the way forward. You know, that 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 before anything else. But I also have to say that just saying, well, that's the way it ought to be, doesn't get us there. Um, society, the hierarchy, you know, whatever you want to say, the culture uh, applies great great pressure uh, on men. You know, to to tell them this is not, you know, this is not something for you to choose to do or not do. Here is what you must do. And if you don't do it, you will have nothing. You know? Well, and I feel that there are a lot of cultural they the same things. Thing. They say the same thing to uh, girls becoming women. This is not something, you know, for you to figure out how to uh, how to negotiate with your future partner. This is just. This is your life, you know. You're gonna be a nurturer. You're gonna be a, a caregiver, and you're gonna, you know, be a mom. You're gonna be uh, a feminine component of society, and that's just the way it is, you know. And we have painted ourselves into a corner in modern life, uh, out of which we cannot get until we recognize that um, this should never be something. Uh, that people are are coerced into doing, but something that they need to learn how to choose to do. If we can't do that, then all the discussion, you know, about who has it worse and who's doing it wrong, um, isn't going to take us anywhere. We have to figure out what to do. Well, I think that you're discounting the amount of cultural shifts, at least in the West, that are moving towards diversity of gender expression, gender roles, how people conduct themselves in relationships. I'm not wishing upon a star here. I'm looking at the actual trends of peers within Gen Z, which is the future, and future generations and their attitudes and their approaches towards dating and towards um, living their life and expressing their gender and their sexuality and how they choose to engage in personal relationships. So I'm not just like choosing you know sporadically like i'm not somebody who's looking at it from what is gen x like what is gen x doing i'm looking at it from what are the youth doing what are the conversations that are here what are the relationships i'm seeing amongst my peers and from what i am seeing most generally relationships tend to be largely egalitarian relationships can also be more traditional and i'm seeing a lot of variety and i'm also seeing couples making that decision for themselves within the context of their personal relationship that's interesting that you say that because you know and and i confess i'm a boomer but from what i see from this much higher level um is not very much harmony and not very much sense of agency i'm seeing a lot of despair i'm seeing a lot of frustration i'm seeing a lot of anger i'm seeing a lot of uh unwillingness to uh to play the game anymore seeing a lot of resentment you know so maybe you and i are just traveling in different circles but i you know, just honest statement. I don't see what you're seeing. I can agree with I that. I would be the connecting point here. Just well, it's it's about it's, uh, relationships uh, over the, several different generations, and uh, Athena was talking more about Gen X, uh, Gen, Gen Z, Gen, yeah. Gen Z, well, Gen, sorry, you know, Gen Z, the yeah, Gen Z is yeah. well, Gen Z is complicated. I mean, it's, um, it's when it comes early to their 18, views. Right? Or the youngest, the oldest. One. Yeah, Gen Z. I think it, I think it depends on, on what. I think it depends on what circle that you're in. Because honestly, here's the thing: from what I've seen, 
um, there are many, many pockets of people who actually mostly, like what Athena is saying, they have a more liberal view of relationships that, you know, these days um, <laughs> they don't like saying the word wife. They like using the word partner, you know, instead of like husband and wife. But like, you know, um, I've been looking at these fundamentalist, like evangelist, um, evangelist people and you know them they really want to hold on to to traditional gender roles you know but they're doing it like with a modern twist right and for a lot of couples i've seen i have a lot of southern baptist friends right and they're genuinely happy like the husbands like really treat the wives well and they're they're really happy. They really take pride in in how happy they make their families and how they ha- how happy they make their kids and wives and that kind of thing, you know. But I've also seen um, well people talking about it online that like you know the the modern and the traditional fusion has really made things difficult, especially for women, because like the women are now also expected to bring in some sort of income. And they're pretty much blamed for whatever the guy does. Like, even if he's, um, if he goes, like, out and, like, maybe doesn't come to church or whatever, you know, the girl she'll, or, or the wife, she'll be blamed. She'll be like, why, why aren't you making him come to church or something like that? Or if he does something wrong, you know, she's blamed for it, you know. And, you know, oh, she no, now no, has no, a lot of... Of course, yeah, it it depends that on... That sounds a lot like a more traditional model where the the power of the female is recognized. The, the social honestly, power, I would say. Honestly, I don't know because, like, here's the thing. They seem to have this weird thing where they view women as... Again, this is not all Southern Baptists or all evangelicals, of course. This is just a minority of them. But, like, in these some really fundamentalist pockets... Like, they have this view that women are simultaneously inferior and also responsible for all the sins of man, right? So, like, for example, they'll say, you know, because of Eve, you know, it's women, it's only women who commit sins, it's not men. If men are committing sins, it's only because some woman somewhere convinced them to, which is really stupid in my opinion. Like, again, I know that the vast majority of people, even Christians, they don't believe this, but... That's why I'm saying, like, people can pretty much use whatever book or whatever they want to justify their own hatred, you know, of people. You know, so I, I was actually talking to some of these people and I asked them, you know, why the women even put up with this? You know, like, I mean, even me, like, even if I was raised in evangelical or whatever, like, if I was to constantly be held accountable for another person's actions, I would, while simultaneously being told that they're my superior and that they get to do whatever they want to me, including being physically violent towards me, I would just leave after a while because I would not put up with it, especially in a country like in the U.S. where, you know, women don't have to put up with domestic violence, you know. So then they told me that, you know, again, it's maybe because they're afraid of hell or because they're brainwashed or whatever. So, you know, that's what I heard about it. Mm. Well, because we're in a weird period I've when it never comes to Gen Z. Sorry, Ma. I was just going to say, I'm Chris. You know, I've never, ever, ever, ever heard anything about this. It's the first time I've... Are you familiar with Southern Baptist? I've heard of them, but uh, I haven't really, like... Um, like, they're not really on my radar. I'm familiar because I was in that, and I think I mentioned earlier that I was married right out of high school into that, and it was very much of what Kate is saying to be pretty accurate to my experience. Like, yeah. because, of okay. that's a subset well, of people. That's not, like, widespread, I don't think. Yeah, of course well, not. different churches do different things. I mean... I'm not the most religious person. I do have a lot of church friends, though, and it's very interesting to see that they all claim to be Christian or um, have, like, three of them be Southern Baptists, and each church says they're completely different things. So, as Kate was saying, it literally depends on your circle. And then, Athena, going back to your Gen Z thing, 
I think when it comes to Gen Z, it's so complicated because we're all in so many different circles, you know. We've got a lot of people who are realizing, and I know this because there's a lot of group of my own friends, uh, and a lot of people just around that are egalitarians or equalists and they're very open-minded and they're having very 50-50 relationships and working things out. You've also got, as Kate brought up, the circle of people are religious. Some people are more traditional. Um, we still got the circle of radicals, which if we are going to tie this to gender issues, I think when it comes to Gen Z, sorry to offend any other Gen Zers in here, but just to be completely, absolutely truthful, the biggest problems are biggest, the people who are screaming the loudest currently are the people who seem to be going out into some of these protests, and a lot of them are very, very, very uninformed about what the protest is about or the movement or anything. And so they're just stating and reposting opinions again and again and again. That's how we end up in our situation with misinformation and lies and everything we're at right now. Because they are the loudest speaking people. The egalitarians are awesome, but they sort of got a lane attitude. They're not fighting for anything, really. They just act that way in their normal life. They're not speaking up. And so you know, it's sort of a... I don't want to say they don't care, but... They're very lax about everything and just don't see well, importance. When I see egalitarian, I wasn't necessarily meaning like people who are very like activists. I meant more like people that I know. Yeah, relationship wise. Splitting. Yeah, I understood yeah, what you said. I'm just saying yeah. if I'm connecting this with activism, I'm mm -hmm. just saying to, to the activism part of it, our largest speaking group as a generation currently is the uninformed that are going into these protests causing this misinformation and stuff that's currently going on where we've got like people reposting and people supporting all this stuff and then actually not reading anything they posted or anything at all. So they have zero idea what they're doing, but since everyone else is doing it, they want to join. And then we have this basic, basically a mom mentality, a clueless mom mentality of them just following whatever this group or movement is that they support that they're uninformed about. Don't you just then need some good informed leaders or that are able to uh, uh, properly uh, or make sure to guide the group well, basically? You would think that. Um, you really would think that, but... Yeah. I mean, well, you're always going to have some, some want to learn it too. different That's rhetorics the being ignorance uh, is bliss shared. Yeah. Oh, well, if, if you, yeah, if you got a good slogan or a good, a good way of con conveying information, uh, or just tell them to go to a certain, to specific YouTube channels that'll uh, inform people that kind of stuff then we can at least if we can at least convince politicians like we've talked about earlier then we can get legislation and it'll be more fair for people rather than as one-sided as you know, a lot of uh, radical feminists bring into it i do Honestly. think that the point darkisha made was also like pretty valid though like about how it definitely your social circle is going to shape how you view these things because my social circle of people in their early 20s living in Los Angeles who are in creative employment, you know, is not going to be the same as somebody in a, the South in a Southern Baptist community, which is not going to be the same as a bunch of like Ivy League people in New England, which is not going to be the same as anywhere else in the world. So it definitely depends on your group that's going to inform the way that you see things. But I do think just at least from what I see in social media as well, it seems to be that there are a lot of shifts in ideologies towards um, gender dynamics within relationships. Experience um, my own age and uh, social cohort, uh, basically, you know, uh, mid 50s to mid 60s white guys um you know if you want to talk about a lack of awareness and uh 
uh, an inurement of getting used to just things being the way they are, you ought to talk to some of them because it's very difficult. Like the conversation we're having here, it's very difficult to have anything like that kind of conversation with them. Um, they're, you know, they, they've lived many decades under, you know, the status quo, and it's very hard to see anything else. Um, it's a very painful process for me to get to the point where I don't do that anymore and where I work to become as aware as I possibly can um, and, you know, to pay attention. But, uh, Athena, you're right. You know, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it's not what is being talked about in those circles, but rather what is not being talked about, you know, that causes all the trouble. And, you know, I don't blame people in the millennial and Gen Z generations, you know, to take the attitude toward us of, you know, you're just waiting for us to die <laughs> because <laughs> we're, we're useless. Um, and I, believe me, I've had that. I've had exactly that kind of conversation with, uh, like I say, with my own cohort, because it's true. You know, they it's very hard for them to see what is really going on from all angles. And, you know, that goes as much for the women in my, uh, my age and demographic as the men. You know, everything we're talking about here that we talk about comfortably to, for them is terrifying and taboo. You know, they, it's just too much. Um, but, you know, somebody has to do it. Well, first of all, I don't think anybody's waiting for you guys to drop dead. Um, and Athena can correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like maybe a big add to with some of the younger generations is the older people may have screwed up this world. And we sure as hell don't want it. Yep. And I got to confess, I mean, you know, when I look around uh, at things as they are now and remember you know, the the life I lived and the culture that I came up in, very hard for me not to say, yep, they're right, we screwed up, you know, but as much by what we failed to do as anything we did. And uh, one thing we failed very badly at, uh, Athena, you know, going to you, we, fa we my age and, and uh, demographic cohort, failed outright to uh, to encourage and enact a sense of agency in you know the generations coming up behind us to be able to take their own responsibility for um living their own life you know we presented them with a set of gender roles and and uh uh class roles and so forth and said this is the way things are you have no choice um you have no agency this is what you will be and you know, that that was a huge mistake. I've, I've noticed that because personally, when it comes to dating, I never really had much. Like, I don't think age is that big of a deterrent for me. And so I've dealt with people younger than me and as well as older than me, like 10 plus years my senior and the differences are very drastic in my opinion and like what you're saying about this is the way it is like i've experienced that on the older end of the spectrum where it's like no you're the woman i'm picking what's on the menu when we go to the dinner i'm paying for everything i'm opening the door i'm picking you up like that type of traditionalism and then i've seen on the opposite end of with younger people, it's just way more lax. It's like, well, what do you want to do? Well, like, what is this? Are we going to, you know, it's just a different type of conversation. So I do think that there are, like, generational differences. But I think younger people are more likely to try to set the dynamic that they particularly, like, they, they themselves want. Versus, like, older people, I think they just go with what they've been taught for a long time. I don't think we have to necessarily move away from that for the older people to convince them 
that a different dynamic is generally better for society. It's more so uh, making people realize that some things are uh, more gender neutral than than uh, than a specific gender faces it more. Basically, which is the biggest issue I have with some things. Like, uh, well, a lot of people got uh, justifiably angry with with how how uh, Texas is treating the abortion laws, but nobody gets angry about male circumcision, for example. And that's that's also things like a woman's body is sacred, but a man's body is allowed to be violated uh, at at birth just because uh, people have thought up of really weird reasons uh, why it should be altered and that kind of thing. Um, and and you don't really, I don't think that the older generation would be against that if you explain it to them in a different way. Like there's, yeah, there, there's more ways to, uh, more roads to, that lead to Rome in a certain way. And I think that yeah, for for uh, for different generations, you have you need different vehicles to get them there. You know, um, I think that you know one one quote um, I was seeing float around the internet is that you know if if men could get pregnant, there would be abortion centers on every corner or something like that. You know. And like it really shows me, like, you know, what like people think. Abuse shelters are at every corner for men right now, right? Kate, <laughs> Kate, <laughs> Kate. Yeah. So um, something I, that happens in you? your see, yeah, something that happens in your head is not a valid example for the real world. Just that. Um. Okay. Here's the here's here's the reason why I kind of disagree with that, right? Um. Because if we look at you know, men, how they are right now, right? Um, in, in what sense? Yeah. Be clear. Meaning, meaning, like, for example, like, like what he said about circumcision, right? About what he said about the draft, right? About, you know, the fact that, you know, fi something which is called financial abortion, which I don't really agree with, could be considered, but it's not, of course, right? There's still many, many ways that, you know, men as of now, even without getting, even without having the ability to, to be pregnant, you know, they're still having some responsibilities or they're still having their bodies violated in ways that, you know, women are not, right? So I just, I just really don't agree with, with the fact that, you know, if men had been able to get pregnant, that they would automatically have been given the right to have an abortion or something like that. I just, I just disagree with that, right? And, you know, another reason, you know, you know, like, let me give you an, another example, right? So I was talking to a feminist um, one of these days who was arguing with me. And he or she was basically telling me, um, you know, systemic um, historical discrimination against men does not exist because, you know, one of the reasons she gave is that men never had to fight for the right to vote, right? And then, you know, I, I told her, I told her literally, men literally, as in, in the literal sense of the word, had to fight for the right to vote. Because if they did not agree to get drafted, they literally could not vote. So, yeah, in, that, in, that, in, the, in the most literal sense of the word, men literally did have to fight for the right of the vote, to the right to vote. And this, of course, is not taking into account the Chartists, who did try to to extend voting rights to middle-class men, and even they were unsuccessful, you know. And they were, like, beaten, you know, they were treated very horribly by the British government. Some of them were transported, some of them were put in prison with hard labor. So, you know, they were treated in most ways much worse than the suffragettes were treated, you know, even, even without the arson campaign and that kind of thing, right? So it's... It's, you know, people, people, they have like a very, a very bad view of how men and women get treated. You know, they just automatically assume that men are privileged in every single, every single situation, right? 
So that's why I'm saying, we, like, we need to fight against this kind of thing, you know? There are so many things, you know, because I could, I, I could also raise the point that men can be raped. Like, not that if they could be raped. No, they literally can be raped as of now, right? And yet in so many countries, there is no law against specific rape, you know? It, would, it, would it be accurate for a feminist to say if, if men could get raped, then, you know, men would get all the resources and women would get none? No, because, you know, men could be raped right now and there's not much help given to them, you know? So I just, I just found that funny as all. Well. Yeah, I think it's, well, the, yeah, the best thing is, is to make society consider men's issues. That would be the best thing to do. And the, my issues uh, or my question would be generally, how could we best go about this? To make people more aware of, of the issues that are going on. Yeah, and to and to be able to do that in a way that uh, doesn't doesn't make us adversaries of each other. You know, to uh, get past all the hot takes and all the disparities and all of the historical injustices, and say, you know what, you're right. Things are bad. What should we do? You know, um, in previous conversations on this forum, you know, I said, "Well, here's what I do," you know, and everyone everyone seemed to think that was a bit of an overcorrection. Uh, to which I say, "Well, okay, you know, give me something else," uh, because continuously restating the pro the problem and uh, pointing you know, to one side or the other and its culture and saying this is your fault is kind of how we got into this mess in the first place. You know, the time has come to sit down like adults, you know, just like we're doing here, sit down like adults and say, you know, here is my problem and here is, you know, what it's doing to me from both sides and say, you know, something needs to be done. You know, something we need to be able to do better than this or we should all just shut off the lights and go home because we're doomed. You know, that we, have, we uh... have a chance. We have a chance to, you know, do better than this. The, the, you know, like you were saying that, you know, there's a few glimmers of hope out there uh, among younger people that things ought to be different. You know, and my thing is to encourage that. And to uh, try to, you know, silence or at least tone this down, yeah. yeah, the the restatement that this is just the way things are and it all sucks, you know, and and nobody's happy. Well, fair enough. I, you know, I'm not going to deny that, but at the same time, you know, we are humans, and you know, our our hallmark of being human is that we're clever and adaptable and able to overcome not only you know, our our innate characteristics, but also all of our history. It's time to get on that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, one thing I feel like is really important for us, because let's face it, right now we're pretty much viewed as a hate group among people. Um, I think we need to, I don't know if there's a way that we could do this, but it's like, Okay, not ra- not really gatekeep, but like we need to get like we need we need to detach um, our group from people who are trying to hijack our movement for their selfish ambition or for their selfish gain. Because what I've seen is that there are some people who genuinely think the MRA movement is about putting women in their place or that kind of, or that, you know, rubbish, you know. Um, I've seen people online, you know, especially on Twitter, because, you know, Twitter is just the birthplace of all evil, honestly. But, like, I've seen many, many, like, the the MRM movement on this Discord and the MRM movement on Twitter is just worlds apart, right? So, like, on Twitter, it's literally just that, you know, they just genuinely want to be misogynistic you know they just want to say you know it's actually women who are the bad ones and that kind of thing which is not what we're trying to do and then for some reason we just get 
an influx of these white supremacists, homophobes, you know, like, I don't know, like these, these um, alt-right people who want to, in quotes, reclaim masculinity because they think that, you know, gay men and transgender women are a threat to masculinity and they view masculinity as this god or whatever, you know. And I'm not, I'm, you know, the most of us are not here for that. You know, we fight for the rights of gay men just as much as we fight for the rights of straight or bisexual men, you know. We don't consider them inferior or bad or anything like that. And, of course, white supremacy in, in a men's movement makes no sense because if you're going to fight for one type of man, you can't fight for men if you only fight for one type of man. You can't fight for men if you only want to fight for white men, you know. And then it's just, it's mostly just viewed among people as this, like I said, backlash to feminism, you know. So, for example... Um, okay, you might you might say that it is a backlash against feminine of um, the more toxic aspects of feminism, or like this specific discrimination against men, which has become a result of some type of feminist legislator. That I don't mind, but you know what some people believe is that the MRM is all about in quotes, getting women back in the kitchen or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> that's that's what they think it is about, you know? So I, I think, think that's in mostly one the sense, mainstream media trying to subvert uh, the narrative in favor of feminism. Exactly, exactly. So they're like these, um, you know, I was listening to, I think her name was Catherine Spiller, or there was another feminist who was talking about the MRM. And then she was saying that um, you know, essentially what the, the, the men's rights activists want is that, like, they're really angry because, like, in the 60s and the 70s, like, they wouldn't have to iron their own shirts because that was done for them by women, and when, and women don't want to do that anymore, so now they're upset. Like, that's not, that's not what we want at all. I mean, like, <laughs> I, that, that's not what we want, you know? So, like, even the female MRAs, it's not that... They want to go back to a traditional way of life where women were oppressed or men were oppressed or whatever. You know, that's totally the opposite of what we want, you know. So um, I think I think where the problem lies is that when we reject theories of patriarchy and misogyny, many people think that we're saying that misogyny is OK or that women being oppressed is OK. We don't we don't consider that okay at all but we have to do a kind of I don't know how we're going to do it exactly but we need to do a kind of reclaiming of our image because yeah. you know right now the image is just that you know we're all a bunch of misogynists you know uh, meeting in uh, having a patriarchy zoom call you know, discussing how we're going to oppress women, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's, that's the view, you know, and, and, and again, they bunch us with, they bunch us with um, the, the incels and, and the MGTOWs and, and, and I'm not talking about the MGTOWs who just want to be left alone without getting married, I'm talking about like the crazy misogynist ones, and the, 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 these red pillars, the one who, again, I, I, I totally yeah. dislike the the red pill guys because, let's be honest, apart from them being misogynistic, they're pretty misandrous. Like, if you believe that 80% of men are just trash, then, yeah, I mean, how much more sexist can you get, you know? So, I, I we're, we're not with them at all. Like, we have nothing to do with them. And yet, we're bunched with them all the time. Like, people will literally say incels slash MRAs slash MGTOW, you know, for example, when they're making a, like a, a meme or a joke or something, you know, like people don't think that there's a difference between us and those other guys, you know, so, yeah. I think the best thing we can do is, uh, well, yeah, create grassroots movements uh, in, in outside of Discord and in Discord, try to convince more people that 
the minerals are just people. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have, yeah, we have the same valid uh, reasons to exist as, as anybody else. Uh, but, uh, and also, yeah, be able to pr provide uh, evidence-based uh, counterpoints to feminism and the mainstream ideals. Uh, and then, yeah, just keep convincing more people and eventually we'll uh, be able to start political movements and then we'll get cultural change and societal change, hopefully. I would say. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think we're going to get any uh, huge corporate backing because we're we're basically uh, claim we're saying we're, we're for men, so we're not trying to uh, trying to say we're saving women from being victims, or we're, yeah, we're we're not appealing to any to anything that that they would want to uh, sponsor. So we're going to have to do it ourselves, and I think if we find enough people, we'll be able to fund it because well, lots of people have pocket change and lots of pocket change can become something hey uh, I'm just thing. going yeah uh, I'm just going to stop the stream in a second so uh, thank you everyone for turning up I'm going to uh, leave the voice chat on so uh, feel free to carry on but uh, thanks for everyone who's listening in on YouTube and thanks for everyone turning up uh, I think it's been quite a good one so uh, Good night, everyone, and we'll see you again at uh, the usual time probably next week, although it does depend on uh, some new schedules, so it might be 5.30 again, but it will be on the same day. Uh, good night, then, and everyone yes, else, carry on. See ya.